Coming up on Tech News Today, EA gets Navy SEALs in big trouble. NVIDIA saved by tablets and Priceline buys everything. Well, they bought Kaya. All that more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. What, this? This is Tech News Today for Friday, November 9th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Landtronics, maker of the X Print Server. Print from your iPad, iPhone, or any iOS device to virtually any printer. For more information, visit xprintserver.com slash twit and enter the coupon code TWIT to receive free shipping on your order. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. I'm Darren Kitchen. And I'm Jason Howell. Way and, back here. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world. Put them in context for you, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. <laughs> Let me tell you, EA's Medal of Honor Warfighter better be good. It's been out since October 23rd, but it just cost at least seven Navy SEALs their military careers. Seven members of Team 6, one of which is reported to be Matt Bizanette, who took part in the Bin Laden raid, have been disciplined for misuse of command gear and disclosure of classified material in connection with two days of paid consultation with EA. The sailors lose half pay for two months and receive punitive letters of reprimand, which most people agree will prevent any possibility of future promotion. It took years of testing and preparing, and now the Australian government formally abandoned a plan to filter its domestic internet. Officials now say that it will use Interpol's worst of child abuse site list as a way to shield Aussies from the internet's worst content. The push for a filtering program had largely been promoted by Family First, that's a conservative party down under, but definitely had its share of critics. In fact, in 2010, Google told Australia its program had gone too far. So they're probably happy with the way that things shook out. NVIDIA announced a record high revenue of $1.2 billion in the third quarter. NVIDIA also said that its, uh, third qu its non-PC business, that's pretty much its Tegra line of processors, now accounts for a third of its total business. Three years ago, NVIDIA's non-PC business only accounted for 7% of their revenue. AT&T is expanding FaceTime over cellular access to more customers. Uh, Mac Rumors is reporting that AT&T announced today that it plans to allow any customer with an LTE device on a tiered data plan to use iOS 6's FaceTime over cellular feature. Now, this change only affects iPhone 5 and iPad with LTE customers with tiered plans, not unlimited plans. And now the bad news. NPD Group reports total retail video game sales fell 25% from $1 billion in October 2011 to $755.5 million October 2012. Hardware sales fell 37%, but accessories sales offset that a bit, rising 5%, largely driven by people buying accessories for Skylanders Giants. Good news is these numbers don't include digital sales like Steam or mobile sales like the App Store, so gaming in general is probably doing okay. Priceline is buying rival Kayak for about $1.8 billion just a few short months after Kayak went public. Kayak allows users to quickly and easily compare pricing for hotels, flights, and other travel services. The deal is expected to close uh, in first quarter of 2013. Kayak will operate independently from the rest of Priceline, and Kayak's current management will remain to run the business, or so say the two companies. William Shatner will be everywhere. Apple got slapped in the FaceTime. Vironet X is suing Apple again over patents related to FaceTime. The company already won over $360 million in damages against Apple for patent infringements. The new suit targets a different class of devices, including the latest iPhones and iPads. Pinterest users have frequently asked for a private option, and now they get one. Pinterest software engineer Everett Nome wrote in a blog post, quote, we hope that secret boards will make Pinterest even more useful. Pinterest is rolling out the feature by letting users create up to three secret boards. This feature is available from iOS and the Android apps. 
Judge Lucy Coe will give Samsung one last shot at Apple. After the Apple-Samsung patent case this summer, Samsung alleged that jury foreman Velvin Hogan hid the fact that he had been sued by Seagate in 1993. Samsung and Seagate have a close business relationship. Hogan says he was only asked to disclose the past 15 years of his business history, and that's why he didn't disclose the Seagate thing. U.S. Federal District Judge Lucy Coe has now said she will consider the questions. In universal translator news, Microsoft posted that a, a demo. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's right? coming last week too. That's the weird thing. <laughs> Microsoft posted a demonstration of a translation tool that turns English into spoken Mandarin. The crazy thing is, is that the translated voice is the same voice as the original. The system use, uh, uses a library of tones generated by the speaker combined with recorded speech from a native Chinese speaker. Microsoft says that one word in about seven or eight is incorrect, but this is a 30% reduction in error than previous methods, and they're getting closer all the time. I wonder if you have to record all of your tones going, ah, e, u. Did you see that, uh, uh, that uh, tech crunch uh, article saying that there may be no market for universal translators because they're not precise enough for like business use and they don't know if enough travelers would use them and nobody wants to talk to friends because if you have a friend they already speak your language a way to rain on that parade i yeah. don't know i Boo. yeah i i can see where the business traveler is like listen i can't get this like word wrong and offend these people yeah, i'm trying to sell a bunch of semiconductors yeah, right. to but I don't want to believe that it's not a good idea I'd to make. It. I would too. Hey, Microsoft, if you want to pay me to travel the world trying to use your product and see what kind of cultural faux pas I can get myself into, let me know. I'd do that. I, I don't think they would. I think it's kind of the opposite. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Landtronics. Whether you're at home or in the office, printing from your iPhone or your iPad can be a challenge. Uh, if your printer isn't AirPrint compatible, sure, there's lots of air, AirPrint compatible printers out there, but... Do you have one? Do they, do you, are they everywhere you go? Are they in your office? Uh, you're out of luck unless you get the XPrint server wireless printing device from Landtronics. Uh, you may think, oh, okay, how, how well is this thing going to work? I know about printing and networks. It's it's really hard and it's buggy and you have to do a lot. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Landtronics, I've tried it. You plug in the Landtronics box uh, to your printer, to your, to your network, uh, and then you don't have to install any software on iOS. It, it basically works like AirPrint uh, and and will then send your print job to any printer, almost any printer on your network. I, I, it worked fine with mine, supports more than 4,000 top brand network printers, so likely you're going to be fine. Automatic discovery and set it. Just open it, plug it in, and print. The Home Edition is $99, supports up to eight USB and two network printers. Uh, and the Network Edition is $149 and supports unlimited network printers. Great for your home or your office allows your USB printers to be shared with all the users over a network. So you get the side benefit, if you've just got a USB printer, of turning it into a network printer. Uh, go to xprintserver.com slash twit for more information and to buy. We've got a special offer. Use the coupon code TWIT to receive free shipping on your order. Remember, visit xprintserver.com slash twit and at checkout, enter the coupon code TWIT. We thank Lantronics for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's start off talking about that Navy SEALs uh, story. CBS News was the uh, first that I saw reported. I think CBS and CNN both were reporting that uh, seven Navy SEALs, all from Team 6, that's the uh, the famous team that took down bin Laden, and in fact, one vet of bin Laden, I mentioned that Matt Bizanette is thought to be among these seven uh, getting disciplined. Uh, Venture Beats, Games Beats section reported about a month ago uh, that Bizanette was part of more than a dozen uh, consultants that EA hired for Medal of Honor Warfighter, uh, and the paid consultation was for authenticity. Now, they weren't trying to replicate the Bin Laden raid, per se. In fact, a lot of this stuff happens in Somalia in the game. But it is, quote, a visual representation of human action in combat that takes authenticity to a new level. However, you have to get permission if you're in the military to do this sort of thing, to reveal any kind of information. So they have now been charged with violation of Article 92, that's misuse of command gear and violation of, well, that's violation of Article 92 orders violation and violation of Article 92 dereliction of duty, which is disclosure of classified material. They lose a half month's pay for two months, but they also get a punitive letter of reprimand, uh, and that goes into their permanent record, and most people are saying that that letter of reprimand will pretty much block them from future promotions. 
Uh, when CNET contacted EA for comment, PR director Peter Wayne told them, we do not know if the veterans who consulted on the game were in contact with the Department of Defense. That's kind of an oversight on EA's part in a way. Uh, they they were either yeah, not like, aware or should okay have been you, aware. You're, you're here? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, SEALs consult on things all the time. They consulted on Act of Valor, the the movie. There's two other upcoming Hollywood movies. With the blessing of Admiral William McRaven, he's the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, so it's not a problem to consult. It's a problem to consult without prior approval. And apparently, we don't know what they disclosed that, that violated Article 92, but they, they disclosed things they weren't supposed to disclose. I mean, it just goes to show you how, I guess, uh, thorough EA is when it comes to designing a game that they're going to have consultants like this for that. Because this is, you know, this is a very famous, you know, team. What they, what they, that mission was all over the news for for months. And the thing is, I would imagine the EA probably thought, hey, you guys wouldn't talk to us if it would ruin your career, would you? Maybe that kind of thing. I don't know if they do. They actually have to vet every single person that's ever been a consultant with it them. Would, it would seem to me as a business who does this, you know, you're electronic arts. You're not a developer on Kickstarter who's just getting started. You've been doing this for, for decades mm -hmm. that you would say, now we, we want to make sure that you guys have, you, you've got approval. You're good. You're clear. Uh, and we don't know, maybe, maybe they did that. But what Wayne said and to, to CNET is we don't know if they were, if they consulted, uh, if they were in contact with the department of defense. What's or the not. payment situation too? I think it's is, okay to get paid. It just all has to be above board. It's okay to get paid to, to, I mean, they're to using, reveal things well, that nobody knows. I it's mean, not okay to get paid to reveal classified information, yeah. right? It, it's not okay to reveal classified information. But if you have expertise and it's okay to make other uh, the, avail that expertise to others, why not get paid for it? I well, think that's okay. Sh sure. I, I'm, I'm not against someone getting paid because they have expertise that it, it would be almost impossible to replicate with anybody else. But to not disclose that to the the military that you're working for, I mean, that is a gross oversight on both parties. Doesn't it seem un unusual that we have seven that have been disciplined? There's four others who are no longer with Team Six who are being investigated. That that may uh, end up with up to eleven people. You, none of them thought. I mean, it seems like somebody somebody was under a misimpression somewhere because I can't imagine 11 SEALs would go consult with EA knowing like we're going to get in trouble for this. Well, I mean, I mean, maybe the payment was such that it was attractive enough so that it was like, let's ask for forgiveness after this is over and sort of feign like, oh, we didn't realize we were doing anything too wrong. There's no contract that so we signed so that said we couldn't do this. I I'm just saying usually the stupid decisions like this are motivated by money. I find it really odd that the uh, Navy SEALs uh, would be cooperating in such a manner just because it, it, hasn't it always been that the Navy SEALs are like the secretive ones, the, you know, the ones where you don't get that kind of info from. But, uh, you know, you, maybe you're right, Sarah. I mean, I hadn't thought about the fact that, like, sure, they, they get their pay docked for two months, uh, but I'm sure it's nothing compared to what EA uh, may have paid them. What is also seems weird here is that uh, EA didn't go to the DOD for approval on this. You know, it seems that in, at least in the book publishing industry, isn't that just kind of like a normal thing? Like, well, you know, if, if Brett, you, you, Brett, that's a good, real good point, Darren, because Matt Bizanet is named as one of the one of the SEALs that got disciplined. Uh, and he is the guy who wrote the book without permission uh, that is, has caused a lot of controversy as well. So that implies that that maybe there's there's a, a streak of this kind of behavior, at least in, in that particular individual. Could it be that this kind of consulting is kind of brand new? I mean, is this something that often happens to the point where these these people would actually be aware of a policy like this? The fact that you can't talk to a game company about who knows what exactly they talked about. But if, if they're just saying, like, this is how we did it, we went this way and that left and right, then whatever. I mean, is it just because it's just being like being naive, not just stupid, but like. I didn't even know this was a rule. So who who would think that uh, that seals would be talking to game? Well, that goes back to what you were saying, Darren. I mean, the, the seals have generally been secretive and don't talk about this stuff until recently. They've started to raise the public profile a little bit, and maybe this is a, a stumble along the way of of learning the new rules. Well, also recently, I mean, EA is and, and other publishers are going crazy with these uh, kind of modern warfare types of games. Um, and I just uh, and before I think of like Top Gun and those things, which were recruiting films. Um, and I'm sure all of those were in cooperation with the armed forces through their PR departments. So uh, I don't know, maybe it's just like the empowered individual, like maybe there's an association with video games. 
Um, I, I don't, and I don't know. It just it seems weird to me how like much these recent events are glorified. Whereas you know, I, I don't know how long it was probably after World War II that the first World War II video game first came out, but it just seems like the the turnover is much faster now. Mm. Interesting. Admiral William McRaven, uh, by the way, uh, has 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 definitely been one of the drivers to raising the profile of the SEALs, allowing them to to cooperate and share their expertise. Uh, we mentioned those Hollywood movies. Uh, and so it it seems like there's a missing piece to this story to me. And, and I, I don't want to speculate any more about what it is, but I'll be curious if it comes out. Let's, uh, let's get back to some harder tech, though. NVIDIA is doing well, and it's because of tablets. Yeah, so they, they record, reported their third quarter numbers. Really great revenue for them. Uh, it was a record of $1.2 billion. They're saying that a third of their business is now non-PC. Their Tegra 3 powers the Nexus 7 and the Surface RT. And in the, in the call to analysts, the uh, CEO of NVIDIA had a, some great sound bites, including our view of the PC total addressable market is it's being eaten by tablets, and then, quote, a great tablet is better than a cheap PC. So I'm just kind of curious what, uh, Darren, what do you think of that kind of statement? And would you think Intel would maybe kind of take uh, umbrage with that? Well, I mean, I, I can totally see that there isn't any money in cheap PCs like there were netbooks anymore. At least, uh, you know, those near uh, cost tablets like the Amazon Kindle Fire and the Google Nexus 7, at least with those, you have tie-ins to ecosystems of digital goods like your apps and books, movies and TV and all of that stuff. So you didn't really see that when the EPC launched in 2007. Um, so I don't know. I think uh, when Tegra launched a year later, it really proved that those inexpensive ARM chips, even the first gen Tegra stuff was like 600 megahertz ARM, totally usable when you have that kind of chipset that brings a GPU to the table. And when you look at the alternatives, they're all through like Qualcomm and Texas Instruments and Samsung, and, and I don't see those as major players in this market. So I think, um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see actually how Intel responds to that market. Are people just more forgiving of tablets when it comes to performance? I mean, the thing is with PCs, you kind of have this expectation that it's going to perform a certain level. Because if you dealt with a really good PC with great specs, it's pretty dang fast. But even the fastest tablet isn't isn't doing the same kind of horsepower. Well, but do you apply the same, uh, I, I know what you're saying, I'm, I'm trying to think this through, do you apply the same level of performance expectation to uh, an ultralight laptop or an ultrabook or a netbook? I mean, I, I feel like that's what's happening here is people are saying instead of a cheap EPC, which I definitely don't care about the performance, right? I'm buying an EPC because it's $100, $200. And instead of that, I'm saying, well, the tablet gives me mobile it gives me uh it gives me a, a nice touchscreen interface i'm going to go for that you know at 199 dollars for a nexus 7 instead of an epc it, it, in fact i think it i think it's i think you're bringing up a really good point which is it's not the people who care about performance that are buying these tablets this is the the mass market and, and obviously nvidia's got they're they're this is a bit self-serving obviously because they're making processors for tablets they're not really necessarily in the I mean, they're in the pc market with their graphics cards it's not like they're they don't two, obviously two-thirds of their revenue is still coming from uh, you know their graphics so i'm just i'm just kind of curious if uh if intel is just going to do anything about this with their tablets they're trying i know that with the surface rt it's confusing the heck out of people because it's supposed to be a pc it's supposed to be a tablet and neither party is satisfied no, either groups are just like like i was on windows weekly yesterday and we could not figure out exactly who this machine was for because it was so compromised on both levels that were that nobody on the panel knew what to do with it. Well, that's a, that's the weird thing about the Surface that it, when I've been using it is I love it, but I'm not sure what to use it for. Right? It's it's actually well, why do you a, love it then? I, when I. <laughs> So I force it right. So I get the surface, and I, I force myself to use it. I'm like, this is great. I've got a, I've got a you cursor. Hold a gun to your head, and you love it. No, no, no. It's not like that. I, I, I've got a cursor. I've got multiple windows. I've got a nice touch screen. Like I'm using this and nothing else right now, and it's great. It's a uh -huh. great experience. Then I put it away, and then a use case comes up. Like I need to update my blog. I grow grab my Zarisa Ubuntu laptop. Oh, I, I, you know what? I need to just uh, check my email. I grab my phone. Mm -hmm. I, the, it's not taking the place of anything else and and believe me I, I know that most people don't have 16 devices lying around like this but i'm not finding that niche where i'm like oh the best tool for this job is the surface rt it, it's as i have said it's kind of crossing those those lines well that's the problem that most tablets have right is that they're good for certain stuff but it's not your number one computer when you really have to get stuff done i know very few people who can honestly say that about any tablet whether you've got some sort of a keyboard add-on 
or it's part, think that, of, part of the surface. Go ahead, Darren. Do you think that's because of the software or the hardware? Because, I mean, I've seen a bunch of hardware hacks where it's like, you know, these kind of like hybrid devices. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the Asus Transformer, for example. So do you think it's because like those uh, tablet OSs are just not ready? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think I think the whole, the draw of tablets and the iPad at the beginning, you know, of the, of this tablet craze was that it's really different. Wow, you can touch it and look, pinch to zoom and this and that and you use your hands and everything's very, very uh, tactical. And then it turned into, well, I love it. And now I want it to work like a computer. So we're yeah. still in that phase of of crossing over. And the Surface seems to be uh, doing enough stuff different that people are like, wow, this is really compelling. But again, if you don't want to use it all the time, that's not effective. The thing, the crazy thing about tablets is they use underpowered hardware to do all these things. And what, what uh, the, the manufacturer said is, look, when you make your software, it better run snappy on this. The thing about PCs is they've gotten faster and faster and faster. When you have software that can take advantage of really great hardware, it gets crushed or destroys that, that lousy processor, so it doesn't have the same experience. So I, I'd also argue the other side of that, which is software doesn't need as much hardware as it used to. You know, it used to right. when we went from 90 megahertz to 100 megahertz, that was a big jump. Going from 1.5 to 1.7 gigahertz, not not that big of a right, jump. But to handle you know multiple tasks and notifications and all those other things. Oh, it can handle it. Microsoft Surface handles multiple tasks just fine. A lot of that's design choice, not not limited on the, on the hardware, I think. Yeah, and I haven't used the Surface to know how it handles the multitasking aspect, but like my view of this has always kind of been the computer, the PC, the laptop, whatever, they're productivity devices. And you could say that about tablets and everything, but the reason that they're so useful in that way is because of the way they handle multitasking. You can fly between things really quickly with the use of a keyboard and quick keys and all that kind of stuff. Any of the times I've used a tablet, if you try and kind of take that computer paradigm, that PC paradigm and shift it into the tablet, it's not quite as effective. It can multitask in air quotes, but it's just not the same. You're kind talking of about approach. Android and iOS now. Right. Have you used the Surface or uh, the I Playbook? I haven't used the Surface because or the Playbook. both the Playbook and the Surface are on that kind of hardware that IaaS is calling underpowered, but great at multitasking. Mm -hmm. And and I would say to to Sarah's uh, and uh, point and to uh, uh, Jason's about like the the whole paradigm there is what you were saying was you know when we all got our first iPad we we're like oh this is really exciting and when you use it for everything and then you want to start using it like a computer that's where it really falls flat. And I don't think it's because, and yes, multitasking has gotten a lot better, but I don't think it's because, you know, it doesn't work well as a computer. It's just that those applications that were previously on a computer didn't work well on a tablet. And that's changing as more and more apps come out. I mean, and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I know that like updating your, your blog is so much easier using the WordPress app than it is, say, using uh, the WordPress backend in your browser on a tablet. All right, let's uh, move on to the big acquisition of yesterday that had us all Quoting William Shatner. Priceline bought Kaya. Were you quoting William Shatner <laughs> really, last no. night when you read the news? Priceline. I pulled out my Chateauetry app. And, <laughs> yeah. well, that was, and spent about two seconds with it. What a fun it. randomizer that was. <laughs> oh, boy. Priceline has bought Kayak for $1.8 billion. If you're not familiar with Kayak, um, this is actually a service I've been using. It uh, started back in 2004. IPO'd just... Uh, earlier this year, July 20th. Um, so it's really only uh, gotten through about a quarter of earnings before Priceline said, we want you. Priceline is world's largest travel company. Um, not only uh, now owns kayak.com, but booking.com, agoda.com. That's an Asian-based uh, hotel booking system, rentalcars.com. So this is sort of rounding out um, a lot of the, the, the deals that Priceline can give folks. And it's pretty good price, actually, considering that Kayak has only been public for a short time. Priceline is offering about $40 per share of Kayak. Kayak is currently trading at about $30 per share. So that puts Kayak at about $1.8 billion. They've got $500 million in cash. They've got $1.3 billion in equity um, and assumed stock options. Both boards at both companies have approved the deal. Uh, it does have to go through shareholder approval. That's expected to, to close uh, in Q1 of next year. But the thing is that Kayak's directors and officers represent 77.9% voting power. So even if the shareholders were really upset about this, it's probably not much that they could do about it. Uh, but it seems to be 
at least on the surface, a pretty good deal. I mean, Priceline gets a company um, that's heavily uh, using the ITA airline search software. Um, Kayak is a respected brand. Um, it had, had, a nice, had a nice public quarter. And Priceline gets to get into that market uh, a little bit. What's interesting is that in a separate SEC filing from this deal, Kayak says it has extended a marketing services deal with Google through October 2014. This has nothing to do with the ITA airline search software that Google bought back in 2010. And you might recall that at that point, everyone said, oh, what's going to happen to a company like Kayak? I mean, if Google does this and it's just built into their search results, Kayak is done for. Didn't really happen. In fact, not only did Kayak, uh, was Kayak allowed to continue to license ITA software, but so does Microsoft Bing. I mean, this is not something that Google bought and Google, then shut Google down. Google did not become as anti-competitive as people feared they would. Right. I, I'm sure that's partly because they legally would have had a lot of issues if yeah. had they tried to do that. But nothing really changed. And people didn't say, oh, you know, if Google is offering it, then Kayak ceases to exist. Uh, in, in many of the ways that larger companies tend to offer features that are already available, uh, the Kayak app, the iPhone app, I think has been downloaded something like 20 million times. I mean, it's Does that like, become a Priceline app? Because all of a sudden that extends Priceline's mobile footprint well, quite a bit. Well, both Priceline and Kayak say, even though Priceline is now the parent company, these will be two separate brands for okay. the foreseeable future. It's kind of like Facebook and Instagram, right? Sure. Instagram is its own thing. You like that brand, you don't even need to associate it with Priceline. So I think that that's a smart thing. Um, I, one of my friends on Twitter said, ah, my, my least favorite travel company is buying my favorite travel company. My life <laughs> yeah. is over, you know, that sort of thing. And it's like, but it doesn't need to be because if they're smart, they know, hey, you might not be using Priceline because you don't like it, but you might be using Kayak because it's the best travel service, rental car service, hotel service that you can find out there. And guess what? Now we just reap the rewards of both. This is Priceline deciding we, we want to diversify our business. We want to buy Kayak and have Kayak be Kayak not change yeah. Priceline necessarily. They're buying it because it's a good, successful it's business. It's kind of like when Microsoft bought Expedia and I stopped using Expedia. This is back in the late 90s. I was like, oh, Microsoft eh, bought Expedia. You know, it was, it was, it was in the uh, the heyday of, of Microsoft's dominance. But Expedia didn't really change. And then Expedia got spun back out by Microsoft. So No, and Expedia hasn't changed since the, since the 90s. Well, yeah. It's still that wonderful That's not piece of JavaScript. Fault. I know. Uh, I actually started playing with, uh, started looking around at the Google ITA stuff since the, uh, since or I'm sorry, the ITA software stuff since Google bought it. And really the only integration that I've seen is with like Google Now, or if you search for a flight and you get like flight stat stuff. But actually, if you go over to uh, matrix.itasoftware.com, basically you get the same thing as Kayak, except it's a lot cleaner. So now I might just start using that. But to what you're saying about um uh, the feeling, the perception of like Kayak versus Priceline. Uh, I think the the reviews on Google Play alone speak volumes. Uh, Kayak has 58,000 reviews in the Google Play Store, while Priceline only has 5,000. Yeah, it's funny, when I saw the story, or saw, talked about it yesterday, I, I had this visceral reaction to Priceline. I haven't used them in a really long time. I don't really care for their ads on TV. Sorry, Will Shatner. But I, I have this like I have this distaste for Priceline. I've liked Kayak before, but I've moved on to Hipmonk because I just like the way they do the travel uh, the, by agony because that's the way I want to look at sure. how bad is this trip going to be. So whether you're going to have two brands, Kayak and Priceline, I'm just really hoping that uh, maybe some of the Kayak culture moves over to Priceline because I remember that it just was a really bad time using it for a long time for me anyway to the point where I just have this gut reaction of no, not using Priceline, won't do it. Well, they're two different things, right. and they know that. So if, you know, if I'm like, I love Priceline because every once in a while I get this great deal. You know, there's a little bit of like a gamble thing going on, but it's sort of a fun game. I haven't used Priceline in a long time either, but I have in the past, and it's actually worked out pretty well. But Kayak is not that at all. So, again, they just diversify. All right, uh, let's take a quick break. Thank Gazelle for sponsoring Tech News Today. Uh, they are they're one of our sponsors, and uh, if you would like to get some cash out of them, you can just go to gazelle.com, uh, click on one of the pictures there and say, oh, I want to sell my iPad. I want to sell my MacBook. I want to sell my Mac. Get an offer. You just tell them what model you have, what carrier you've got, if it's a mobile device, uh, what kind of capacity it has, and then you get a quote after you tell them the condition and lock in that quote for 30 days. That's the best part of Gazelle is once you put in that offer, that offer is yours for 30 days to keep or reject 
Uh, you can you can send in your gadget at any time. They'll pay for the shipping. They give you a shipping label, and you just send off the product to Gazelle. In a couple of days, you'll get paid by cash in your PayPal account or uh, by check mailed to you. It's the, it's the simplest way I've found to uh, to sell my gadgets. So I'm glad they're sponsoring Tech News today because I can give them my wholehearted uh, support. Free shipping, fast processing. Uh, sell your iPhone, your Android, your MacBook. Uh, Gazelle. Dot com G A Z E L L E dot com. Even if you're not sure, if you're like, ah, I'm still skeptical, Merritt, uh, just go to gazelle.com, put in the gadget you're thinking about selling, find out what it's worth, and lock in that quote. It's risk free. Gazelle.com, we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Got uh, a little Yahoo homepage redesign uh, still leaking out there. This is part of what is being called Project Home Run, according to Kara Swisher over at All Things D. Uh, they've been testing this. We've talked about it before. Uh, things have been leaking out like more simplified icons, infinite scrolling. Uh, and now the latest one has sort of a Windows tile or flipboard looking interface. Uh, maybe Pinterest, I don't know. Uh, and, and according to Kara Swisher, the plan is to move from several 300 by 250 sized ad units to a single ad unit. But if you notice on this test page that, that leaked out, there's, there's no ad unit there at all. Uh, it's, 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 a, uh, it's definitely a more mobile-friendly interface. And remember uh, that Marissa Meyer said in her last earnings call, like, Yahoo's future is mobile. We really have to concentrate on mobile first. What do you guys think of this? And, and again, they're just testing these things out. They put them out there. They see how people use them, how they perform. That, that's a, we're looking on the video now at the, at the current Yahoo page as a comparison. When you compare those two, what do you think? I love it. You do? You love the tiles? Yeah, I do. I think, I think it's great. I mean, yeah. what Yahoo wants to do is put front and center uh, a lot of stories that people are going to click on. And they do that really well here. I do. <laughs> I notice the logo is smaller than ever, and I still want to just... I just want to put a ruler under the word Yahoo and just say, okay, everybody, match it wow. up horizontally. You know, we don't need to, like, pretend like we're at a children's party anymore. But I know that that's also brand recognition, and, and they don't want to change too much um, too fast. But, yes, I think Yahoo is in a huge transitional period, and I think design-wise, this makes a lot of sense, and it looks good. I was looking at this this morning, and it look, I think the design is really dead on as well. It's, it's, it's cleaner, it's simple, it doesn't, like, Changed so much to the point where somebody went to Yahoo, they're like, "What site is this?" Like if they went to like a simple search bar or they just you know had I don't know circles up, it'd be very strange. Uh, but <laughs> the new circle interface. And there's some really old remnants on the current Yahoo page of like you know make you know Yahoo your homepage. I mean, who even says that anymore? Uh, the, the word homepage. Who sets their homepage anymore? I don't think anybody does. Then it says the date Friday, November 9, 2012. Nobody has that thing of that little JavaScript that keeps updating the date. That was really cool in 1995 when you're like, "Oh look, my little site always seems updated." Totally unnecessary. Now well, that's no, taken I, out. I disagree with you on that one. I, I, I get I get what you're saying about the uh, some of the 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 relic relic aspects here. But I want the date, uh, so not, I know that I'm looking at a current issue. Not to the detriment of the content though, because the content, the navigation as well, was being pushed down by that date and the sign in and mail, all this extra junk before you even get to the content on the page. And people have big screens though. You can deal with that, right? No, I think it's I think the cleaner design no, is nice. People people have wide screens now and the other problem is that like, you know, most laptops and tablets are, are these really poor 720p kind of displays. And then do they just get like combined and combined with all these, you know, the, the you've got the title bar and then the address bar and you've got your Windows bar, your Ubuntu bar or whatever the hell it is. And uh so you you have less and less vertical space. I, I look at this and it does look very clean and refreshing and i i'm just uh you know i think it's warm and fuzzy that tiles they're the new rounded corners they really are aren't they that's good they're, they're the current they're the current big trend this is the look of the teens of the 21st century is is big old tiles <laughs> look at look at you microsoft we've come so far in 10 way. years apple ugh. microsoft is the way of the future microsoft didn't invent that idea of they squares actually, M actually, of varying sizes. MSN kind of pioneered that. Back well, then they staked their whole company on it, the, the whole Windows 8 interface. Okay, yeah. I'm just saying. No, I, I, okay. <laughs> let's, let's, move, let's move on to the mess that's Google. Sure. Uh, there, was, there was a great article on uh, Search Engine Land by uh, Search Engine Land, excuse me, by Danny Sullivan, and he tore apart Google Shopping. Uh, this is the newest iteration of Google Shopping that launched back in October. And it's, it, the, the difference in October was that the search results would only appear if merchants paid to be included. Up to that point, Google would just index everything and you'd get results from anywhere. And Danny did a bunch of test searches. And it was basically, you could tell by the headline, it's a mess. 
looks up the Kindle Fire HD. Amazon is not one of the paying uh, merchants, so you don't get any Amazon results. Uh, there's all kinds of duplicate results. Uh, there's also incorrect results, like having the Kindle Fire and not the HD in there. Looked up Halo 4, same kind of thing. iPad Mini was kind of a mess. I mean, Google's been working on their product search or frugal or products, whatever they call it. Used it used to be called frugal, right? Yeah. They, since 2002. Okay, this is something they've been. This has been around for 10 years, and if it's still not there when it comes to consumers, does Google even care about this anymore, or are they just like, look, we're getting paid by merchants, so that's all. That's what we're going to show you. The results might suck, but at least we're getting paid. I, you know, I, I worked at CNET for, for years, and Shopper.com was exactly this. It was supposed to be a search engine that found products and that, that was never worked right. It never worked the best that it could, let's say. It actually worked right, but it never worked as, as good as it could because they were always impeded by their own monetization scheme. And when Frugal came along, I'm like, this, Google's going to kill with this because what Google's going to do is say, we're a search engine and we're going to find products and surface the best prices and then we'll sell ads alongside it just like we do a search. And I feel like they've ruined it by deciding to make the same mistakes that Shopper.com and, and frankly, it's not just Shopper. All the, the search sites for products do this where they say, well, you have to pay to play. And we're only going to show results if you're, you're giving us leads. And even if we show results that aren't paying, they're going to be so hidden and so far down because the business needs need them to be far down that it's never going to be the ideal situation. You're never going to see all the prices and you're never going to get fair comparisons. Well, I mean, if Amazon, for example, is not a paying merchant, then it's because Amazon doesn't think that it's worth their money. Yeah. So that's another problem. If, if Google Shopping has large merchants that uh, uh, brand names that people trust who are like, oh, we don't need Google Shopping, then this is just, it's like a it's like a dead zone, really. I think Google's missing out on a big opportunity here, which is a lot of people, and I see people in chat saying the same thing, they go to Amazon when they want to search for a product and find out its price, mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe eBay. Uh, and and Google could, could just take that over if they provided a really good product search engine, but that's that's not what they have. I mean, what I find most confusing is that Google is good at search. Why do they suck at this? This is not a big deal. It's like you can index everything. You used to do this. Why? I mean, Amazon used to be in the results because they weren't paying, and this wasn't their model. This is a, a switched model. And the plan was, uh, when Google was saying, when you switch this model, this is about delivering the best answers for people searching for products. And that's not what this thing is. No. This product is just... They're, let, they're letting the business needs get in the way of delivering on that mission. That just yeah, in fact, opinion. ignoring products in Amazon is kind of akin to ignoring search results in Google. Right. Or, or, or saying, yeah, we're going we're gonna to search the Internet, but some of the most popular sites on the Internet we're not going to index. So would you use that search engine? To like, Of course not. Once you know yeah. for uh, what? Once you look for something specific and you're like, it's not there, and then if, even if you don't realize it's because there wasn't payment involved... You're like, oh, well, that's just, that's the search engine that doesn't actually have everything that I need. I don't need to use that. I want to go straight to somewhere like Amazon where I know all the products are. You know, I really wouldn't be upset about this if they, if, the, you know, the whole pay to play, it's like, that doesn't bug me. But it's just like, put it in the yellow background thing that you do like on the uh, regular Google search where it's like, these are paid results. That's what kills me. They already have a model for this, right? Everyone worried when Google added ads way back in the day, like, oh, it's going to ruin the search. No, the search, they, they respect the search and the search is still fine. And then they, they've made it so that paid ads work. And we all understand like, okay, that stuff's paid uh, and it still works, but this stuff is is real and that, and that still works. Why not just translate that? I just don't. So they have a little blue link that says, why these products? And you click it, and then a little tooltip shows up. And Google's compensated by these merchants. Yeah. The second line. In other words, this is broken. Is what that, <laughs> That's how I read that. Absolutely. Uh, let's finish up with AT&T unbreaking part of their FaceTime service on iPhones. Yeah, so there's there's like a sunny side of the story and then like <laughs> yeah. a frowny dark cloud it's side over of the story. Easy. Right. So I'll start with the sunny part. That one comes from AT&T, uh, who announced yesterday uh, any customer with an LTE device on a tiered data plan can use iOS 6's FaceTime over cellular now. No extra charge. Yay. Of course, you all remember previously only customers on a mobile share plan could use FaceTime uh, over data. AT&T says the feature will roll out over the next 8 to 10 weeks and then also says, well, we're providing other services. Um, we're going to make FaceTime over cellular available to deaf and hard of hearing customers who qualify for special text and data only packages. So we are all about the consumer. 
Then again, this is tiered, not unlimited data plans. So people who have unlimited data plans are not included in this. Jim Sacconi, who's AT&T's head of external and legislative affairs, wrote a blog post about the change, says, listen, here's what happened. There was no way for our engineers to model the usage and the network impact beforehand. So what we wanted to do is just be conservative, hold off on the features until we knew that our infrastructure could handle it. So everyone else who was already using AT&T didn't have dropouts or uh, um, worsening service because we rolled out to FaceTime to too many people too quickly. The Verge says that's a bunch of, bunch of horse pucky. I'm with The Verge here. Yeah. Uh, the Verge says, listen, organizations like Public Knowledge and Free Press are a couple of examples uh, of, of, of orgs who were pushing legal action to get this block removed. That's why AT&T caved. They felt like eventually they would have to. A company like AT&T, this is the dark cloud part of the story, by the way, if you hadn't already guessed. AT&T is just licensing Spectrum. That's all they're doing. If they don't use the Spectrum that they're licensing fully for the good of the citizens that they're providing services to, that is a violation of their Spectrum agreement. If the FCC isn't policing this enough, that's why companies can give us the runaround. Companies convince consumers we're trying to do the right thing, but nobody really knows because the FCC isn't intervening more. And the reason that they're not intervening is because currently they don't have access to internal AT&T data. AT&T says, oh, we're, uh, you know, we, it's, uh, this is just tough for our engineers, gonna take a long time. No one really knows if that's true or not because if the FCC wanted access to this data, it would take months of years of filings and proceedings and it's legal gobbledygook, right? John uh, Bergmayer of Public Knowledge says, if it turns out that they don't make it available to truly everyone, we still plan to file a complaint. What he means is, you know, if, if I have an unlimited plan, I still don't get FaceTime over cellular. Why? No reason. It has nothing to do with that. And that that's what makes the, uh, the explanation a lie. You wouldn't say, okay, we're going to model FaceTime. For some random reason, this one thing, not Skype, not any of the, not YouTube, not any other uh, high bandwidth apps. We're going to model this particular one, which actually has less usage than these other apps. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, when we start to roll it out more, we're, we're going to leave the unlimited people off. Why? 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 why be, you know why? Because you want to move the unlimited people off their unlimited plans. That's why. This is a bunch of horse hockey. And this is what really pisses me off about the carriers is they constantly try to take advantage of the ignorance of people about technology and the way it works by putting out these things that sound reasonable if you don't know any better. Like, oh, they were just testing. They were being careful. I want them to be careful. I want them to not break the network. Well, you know what, ATT? Your network's broken already, and this wasn't the way to fix it. I'm going to take a, a less passionate approach on this one. Uh, so th this this thing about assessing network impact is also like a legal excuse because there are rules that AT&T has to follow. And the thing is, if their network is impacted negatively and it's going to affect everybody, this is the kind of statement they have to make because then at least they said, look, that's why we did it. Now, that's why they officially did it. Everything Tom said, I completely agree with. I think that th this is a complete money grab. But this is the responsible thing to do as a company. And, well, if you have shareholders to say, we need to assess network impact because otherwise the government would have our heads. But the real thing is they want people to be moved over. And the claim is always, oh, well, it's, iPhones have it pre-built in. It's built in the FaceTime app. Who cares? Like, that's not going to make a difference. People didn't use it anyway. It, it, Skype is way more popular. And the fact that AT&T was singling out this one app effectively, it's just nonsensical. Well, and it's a shame, too, the FCC doesn't have uh, its paws into more of this, right? I mean, the, everyone's hands are kind of tied where it's like, well, you know, we, we could get involved, but it would be possibly years off before anyone on the consumer side reaps the rewards of an investigation. So there's a real problem there where AT&T now can say things like, it might take us 10 weeks to turn on this feature. We're, we're going to do it, but it's going to take us a while. Real 10 weeks? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. What? Why? Because it's 10 weeks that AT&T would like to try to get as many people off those unlimited plans as possible. They won't get me off. No, sir. <laughs> they got me <laughs> off right onto Verizon. So, there you go. <laughs> we'll see it, but I'm... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> I, I stay with them because of that stupid unlimited plan that now I don't get other features for because yeah. I'm on unlimited. That's, I'm what, being, yeah. that's the game I'm they're just playing. like, you're going to punish me because I was early to the game? Screw you. Get out of that bad relationship.
<laughs> Let's move on to the random But they give me so much. <laughs> <laughs> but ATT loves me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, Wired has a story today about a, an app on iOS called Curiosity, What's Inside the Cube, from Peter Molyneux. He's a former Microsoft developer. Uh, and it's really taken people by storm. I've been sitting here for over an hour while I'm doing the show, pressing retry on the app. I got, I got the app to load. But I, I keep tapping on retry. Nothing happened. You cannot get into the server to play this game right now uh, because so many people are in there poking away at this giant cube because here's what happens. The entire world is working on getting rid of this cube. It's apparently really fun to do things in the cube. People are etching in messages and, and coming up with nifty ways and new tools to get cubes. And when you get to the center of the cube... One lucky gamer is going to find out what's inside the cube, and Peter Molino swears it's going to change that person's life. This is like the digital bubble wrap. Like this is what people are doing. They're just like pushing these things all day until they get coins and then maybe spell something out of it. Like, <laughs> I could see doing this, especially if you just want to kill time. I mean, I, uh, partially, this it just feels like abusive technology. It's like, come on, we could do much more than this. Like, you know, folding no, home. But what's inside the cube? Darren, what's do you know, do you have a guess what's inside the cube? I think we should ask. Ernest Klein. I know, right? I was thinking I, I, it's totally Ready Player One, isn't it? This is Ready Player One, totally. I love it. I, I don't know. You know, Peter Molyneux has taken some criticism for overhyping things before, uh, and this is the first of 22 games, he says, from 22 Cans, his new independent game studio. Uh, it's certainly off to a flying start. We'll see what happens once we get to the center the of the cube. The next game is like a spear. The next one is like an octagon. Maybe th when you get to the center of the cube, it takes you to the next game. And only that person <laughs> can lead it's everyone like into like the Russian next game. Like a Russian golf kind of thing. There's 22 games inside. Yeah, it's the three gates. Except there's 22 yes. in this game. All right, let's look at, let's take a look at the calendar. Let's. Hey, before I get into the calendar, Darren, do you have something you want to tell people about? Do I? I don't know. There's your initials with exclamation oh, oh, points. Oh, okay. Well, I just threw this in the calendar because it seemed appropriate. I'm so excited. Battlestar Galactica, Blood and Chrome. It's the prequel to the reimagined Battlestar Galactica series that we all know and love. So say we all. It starts today, November 9th on Machinima. I'm going to be there, like, watching every single click, click, click. Bring so me more Battlestar. Yes. Well, great. I am happy about your enthusiasm. It would have been, it's, <laughs> if I would have read that, I would have been like, yeah, so Battlestar Galactica today, Whatever. Machinima. Um, I am excited, though, about a birthday that we're celebrating. Oh, whose birthday is it? Happy eighth birthday, Firefox. Wow. It's been senile. Is it's it just me, or does it feel like Firefox is, is older than eight? It acts older. You it's might really have, mature. <laughs> you <laughs> might have a memory leak. It's very mature for its age. Yeah. Memory leak. Well, eight years ago, what was that, 2004? Yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. Well, It was. It was 2004. Remember, they 1.0'd after yeah. all of the name changes. Firebird. And they actually had this really Phoenix. cool thing where you could uh, host your own Firefox 1.0 release party. I know because I hosted one. And I stayed on Mozilla fun. Communicator. I didn't want to go to Firefox. Oh, thing. yeah. Crazy. yeah. Get up the lawn. Vets and Tech is holding a hackathon in San Francisco this weekend. If you're interested in more information, you can go to vetsandtech.co slash hackathon. The iPad mini LTE will ship by early next week. That is according to certain folks who have gotten emails supposedly from Apple that say so. I am one of those people. And it was a weird email. It almost seemed like a phishing email to me. Yeah. So when I saw anything. that written up, I think it was Mac Rumors said, oh, yeah, it looks like, because officially, when you when I checked my tracking number for my LTE Mini, it says November 21st. Mm. That's the day before Thanksgiving. So now I'm here. I don't know. It's just something seems a little bit weird about it. I don't know if any of you got that email as well, but perhaps I'll get it next week. And if so, I'm not going to complain about it. The Techonomy Conference is in Tucson. It starts on Monday, runs through Wednesday, November 11th through 13th. Google TV is bringing music and movies to Europe on November 13th. And finally, Star Wars The Old Republic is free to play November 15th. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got a message from Thomas Price. Hey, gang, just listened to yesterday's show and wanted to share my experience with Waze Advertising. I love Dunkin' Donuts and am fortunate enough to have one near my house, but not exactly on my morning route. To keep Waze from freaking out about me going the wrong way for the first mile of my commute, I added a favorite location from my nearest Dunkin' Donuts so I could use Waze Waypoint feature for a combo route. Now, anywhere I go, anytime I get close to a Dunkin' Donuts brick and mortar or C store kiosk, there magically appears a DD logo. Uh, pin. It may not matter for my daily commute, but when I go out of town to visit family, it will be hugely helpful to have those little pins on the map so I can start my morning off on the right foot. 
Not sure if Dunkin' Donuts is a partner with Waze or if it simply knows from my favorites that I prefer them, but I have yet to be bothered by pins for other coffee shops like Starbucks. So for now, my map is not overrun by unwanted ads and unrequested info. In my book, that's a win for now. Hmm. And it turns out Dunkin' Donuts is one of the launch one partners. One of the launch partners. All right. Waze ads. I still don't get the Dunkin' Donuts coffee thing. I've had it. It's fine. It's like In-N-Out, but over there, that kind of thing. It's like you, you don't get the In-N-Out burger right. thing. I get the Dunkin' Donuts yeah. thing. But the coffee doesn't taste any... Yeah, the burger oh, you're right. Good. I forgot the about Dunkin' awesome. Donuts. That is totally now an East Coast thing. Go for it. Let's go. After the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks to folks on our subreddit, uh, technewstoday.reddit.com, for uh, submitting links and letting us know what kinds of things you'd like us to talk about on the show. That's where we got our happy eighth birthday, Firefox. Thanks, Captain Kipper, uh, for submitting that. It's technewstoday.reddit.com. And don't forget, we're actually getting close to scheduling our best of show. It'll be the last week of December. Uh, and if you have a moment that you really liked at any point in any show on anywhere on the network, frankly, uh, go to twit.tv slash best of. Pick the program name, give us the episode number, the air date, maybe a time code if you can. That, that is really helpful. Uh, and submit that there. It helps us put together our clip shows at the end of the year, which, you know, clip shows kind of a pejorative, but I always like them because it's a nice review of We do a lot of shows in a year. Stuff. Yeah. Whenever I see those put together, I'm like, wow, what oh, a fun happened. show we're a part of. <laughs> wow, I'd like to do that show. Yeah, it's that nice to like be fun. reminded. We are actually having fun. <laughs> Darren Kitchen, what's going on over at Hack5? Oh, check it out, hack5.org. That's when you can find out about hacking the airwaves with this new tool, HackRF, as well as uh, jailbreaking the Netgear Neo TV. It's a $50 little box that runs Linux and can do fun, happy stuff. Awesome. Uh, and you can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. Email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a phone call. Leave us a voicemail message. The number is 260-TNT-SHOW. It's Google Voice number, so it's a free local call in Butler, Indiana. We want to hear from you, Butler, so give us a call. We'll be back next Monday with an all-new show. Declan McCullough from CNET joins us then. We'll see you. Woohoo!